Dimitri, do you have experience with the brain? The brain it was really cool. <clears throat> I think it's still a really cool program. Uh, it's a little bit too proprietary for me. It's a little bit too hard to write notes in it. But uh, as far as a visualization tool, um, it was a lot of fun. Um, I'm, a, I'm a fan of the brain. I wish I kind of had a reason to use it, but it just just never worked. Oh, Kenny, Kenny's got one. Why do you, what do you not like about Rome? Can you apply light using Rome? Okay, um, I'll be careful with this one as well. I will say this about Rome. It is so powerful. It is the, the most powerful databasing um, machine out there that I know of for, for the common person. What I find is that our tools shape us. Evernote, it encourages you to be a hoarder, to, to collect information. Ulysses and Bear, they encourage you to write. Rome encourages you to connect ideas. That's the beauty. I think it might also encourage you to become a databaser. I don't know how I feel about that. So what about Obsidian? Obsidian also encourages you to be a connector, but instead of a databaser, it encourages you to be a writer. That's the big difference. That's the big difference for me because I want to write. I don't want to database, you know. Um, I, I think we can get caught in this idea of, of janitorial work, of making a million links and tags. So then, you know, you use these, you, these tags and you rely exclusively on backlinks. And it's great. It's great when you have 100, 500, maybe even 1,000, 2,000 notes. I think you're pushing it at about 2,000, though, of uh, real notes. Um, because then when you hit one of these tag, tag links, and it's, it's titled blog, and you try to scroll through all of these daily notes, um, you know, like 200 daily notes that you, you've put blog because you have ideas for this blog. Well, how useful is that? How useful is blog? when you have to then scroll through all this information to try to find the one thing you're looking for. So I, I, think, I think we have yet to see some of the PKM scaling issues of, of typical Rome usage. Now that being said, you can use the linking your thinking framework in Rome. And I think that can alleviate a lot of the problems. For me, I mean, Obsidian, because I'm a connector writer as opposed to a connector databaser, that makes more sense for me. But um, but Rome being as powerful as it is, you can apply the frameworks of map of contents, maps of content, and a home note to Rome, and that you'll get a lot more value out of it that way in the long term. Uh, Joel. Some people in the PKM space seem to have the tendency to toss notes of clippings of text written by other people into their graph view vault, into their graph vault. You've written about that leading to a loss of joy in your note making system. But then how are you ensuring that the notes in your system hook up with text that you've clipped where a lot of connected keywords might be found? Hmm. Um, I don't have the best answer off the top of my head because I think we'd have to really dive into that. I'm trying to break break that apart a little bit, Joel. You've written about, um, but then you, then how are you ensuring that the notes in your system hook up with the text that you've clipped? Um, okay, I, I think the simple answer right now, I mean, this is a very nuanced one. The simple answer is, as I read new information that uh, I'll create a note, not based on the article, but based on the idea from the article. And then I can, in that idea, in this new note that is my idea, you know, evergreen note title, I link to the web article. So in that way, I'm not clipping the article into my library itself. Instead, I created something and then I just link to it outside. Um, that's the bad answer. Uh, I see Paul says, not a great idea long-term to have your PKM in a proprietary cloud system like in Rome. Well, yeah, I, I actually, I mean, th those are kind of the points that I'm really fearful of. I mean, you, someone else has your information. 
how do you feel about that? You, you might be okay with it. Um, but I have a lot of private thoughts, private information. I don't want other people to see it. Even if Rome is safe, is it safe from, you know, like somebody ha wanting to target it and hack it? Um, I don't know. I, I don't feel comfortable with that. That's why Markdown, that's why private files that you can store locally, that's another huge benefit. So thanks for bringing that one up, Paul. Why do you put metadata at the bottom, Joel asks. Keep them coming, Joel. Oh, Eric, I see you have one here forever. Oh, sorry, let me change this one second. Um, okay, the reason I put metadata at the bottom of a couple reasons. So if it is a note and it's not a map, I like to put the, um, the content, uh, the back matter at the bottom. And the reason is just because at the note, singular note level, the most important content is the title and what's being mentioned here. Less important is what it links to and what it tags to, in my opinion. Hey, if, if you feel differently, then just switch the order. Uh, no harm, no foul. Once we get to, um, oh, I, I don't include this one. That's, that's a little bit too much for the light kit. But once we get to a map, then I like to put, you know, this backlink higher level map above it. Um, these are these are personal preferences, but now you know why I do it. Eric asks, "Will I have access to the six-week course forever?" Eric, yes, you will. Not only that, but the six-week course will change in the future, and you'll have access to that. Not only that, but you won't just have access to it, you'll be able to participate with, with the new cohorts. So this fall cohort is cohort two. The first one was the summer cohort, which was the private version. So in this uh, fall cohort, you'll have access to that and then to all future um, iterations and improvement plus the community. So anything that you have access to now, you'll have access to in the future, which I think is uh, pretty awesome. Not only is it um, valuable as a knowledge base, not only is it valuable, well, I should say it's valuable as a knowledge base, but it's also super valuable as um, being a part of a community. And you know, I, I find that the community out here, it's so inspiring. And there are days where I'm not feeling as productive, but the community helps me sometimes get to that level where, I, hey, I got that energy back, all right. And so I think in the same manner that having the lifetime access is pretty powerful. Gustav. <laughs> Gustav, you ask a great question I'm happy to answer. If you realize an MOC is built on wrong assumptions, how do you go about dealing with that? Hey, delete the MOC. The notes don't go anywhere. I mean, hey, if, if you're still looking at this screen, the notes will still exist in this main area, right? It's just the MOC that's gone. Um, and then you can start over or, or you can do whatever you want with the MOC, call it something else. That is true fluidity in, in this structure. That's a fluid framework for you. Carl Palmer. Oh, MM, I'm oh, sorry, MM asks, a bit of a personal question. What do you actually do with your notes? How are they useful for you in the professional personal life? Um, okay, on the personal side, well, I'll start professional side. So uh, professionally, currently, I'm doing two things. I um, am the co-owner of a business that started, wow, 11 years ago and still running called Pink Gloves Boxing. It is a fitness boxing program that's done in person. Um, and I use the personal knowledge management methods that I'm talking about with maps and whatnot. Clunky version in Evernote. Um, that has then been evolved. So I used um, the linking your thinking proto system for this pink gloves boxing program. I also used it to help uh, produce a couple independent feature films. And I'm, I'm trying to think of some of the other uses. Oh, and the most recently I used it as I jumped into a new career in Los Angeles um, as a TV editor and assistant editor. So those are the professional uses. And personally, I, I mean, I just get so much joy of, of hopping into my library. And I do find that as I work on notes, as I mentioned earlier, it informs every conversation I then enter. 
So, I mean, that's a lot of the value I'm getting. Um, okay, next up, Carl, I didn't get to your question. I see the workshop has six live team. This, okay, yeah. I see the workshop has six live team sessions, 90 minutes each. I live in the Southern Hemisphere. Are you able to say what time those live Zoom classes will be? We are going to solidify that time. My best guess right now is that it's going to be um, 8 or, oh no, excuse me, 9 a.m. Pacific time. So that's the time right uh, when we started this Zoom session, except two hours earlier. That's the most likely Zoom time. Um, there is a possibility we split it up into two sessions depending on location. We did this in the private cohort one. So if there is really this big split in the hemispheres and we need to, we, we can approach that. So I'm very, very open to do that. And we've done it previously. I think it's best if the group can be together, but let's see what happens. Oyster sauce. Do you recommend writing X number of notes every day? No, I, I think you should write them as the opportunity um, comes up. Now, if you are a serious professional knowledge worker, well then yeah, then you, you have to put in the work. It just depends like what you're doing in, in life. Um, a good metric to consider um, is this. How many evergreen notes did I write today? And maybe you just, you want, you want to get above three. It doesn't seem like a lot, but three times 365, you're doing a lot of work. So that, that's something to consider. This is from Mike Braddock. Uh, thank you, Mike. Um, can you talk about the conventions you use and follow and how you developed them? That is a little uh, vague, but I'll, I'll try to think about it from that Zettelkasten um, background. The conventions I use, uh, I would say is this, the conventions I use are uh, based on Zettelkasten um, ideas, methodology, so like atomic notes written in your own words and linked to other notes. Uh, the problem I was having is that I really wanted that higher level view. So that's what you know you would be familiar with as a structure note. When what, what I realized though is that I wasn't just indexing information into a structure note. I was actually using the structure note as the 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 main note where I spent my time. It, and this is why I call it a map of content because the map of content ser MOC serves three different purposes, assembly, uh, collision, development, and uh, unification, where you unify it with the rest of your knowledge. So in, in that way, I was finding that the my work was done mostly in the map of content. I was going there to sharpen ideas against each other, to ground them together. And then I was getting all these diamonds. Um, and I thought it was a little crazy. I didn't want to share it with um, the Zellkosten forum because uh, I didn't think that would fly too well. And it seemed like, what am I trying to do? Like add all this structure back in. But I think for me, the big realization was it's not just structure. For one, it's fluid structure. It's, it doesn't get in the way, it's not rigid. But two, it's a way to take my thinking to another level because of how I'm arranging these notes, how I'm working ideas, fleshing them out, creating ideas. I see where the gaps are in arguments and then creating ideas from there. So um, hopefully that answers your question a little bit.